Thank you very much. <clears throat> well, it's, a, it's an honor, if a sad one, to be uh, talking at this conference uh, in memory of Jean Christophe. Um, I first met Yoko's in 1984 when I was visiting the IHES to work with Dennis Sullivan as one of his first graduate students. And, um, and I was also present during his beautiful lectures on local connectivity of the Mandelbrot set at most points, which Misha Lubitsch just explained so, so uh, beautifully. And, um, and since that time, our trajectories, while not exactly parallel, have sort of fellow traveled. And uh, we both worked in complex dynamics at that time. And, and in later years, we, we both worked on dynamics over moduli spaces. Uh, albeit from slightly different uh, perspectives. Yoko was working with interval exchange transformations. Um, and so it's, it's a real pleasure to be able to talk in, in his honor. Um, I, I want to talk today about some work with my coworkers, Alex Eskin, Ronan Wukamel, and Alex Wright. And uh, I would place this work in quite general terms in the setting of a realm where Yoko's was a master, the world of rigidity and especially of renormalization. Uh, and uh, the, the main topic will really be dynamics on moduli spaces, as I'll explain, and more precisely, and in a very elementary sense, uh, polygonal billiards. Now, why have I chosen as my frontispiece the Institut Oceanographique? This was another possible place this lecture might have been held. This was where I last spoke in Paris. Uh, it's for the following reason. I want to primarily discuss um, a couple of results which show we are still in the age of discovery. We are just beginning to explore uh, the territory um, of dynamical systems on moduli spaces and even of polygonal billiards. And the evidence for this I'll describe are the following new results. The first one is that there exists a totally geodesic complex surface, which I call F, in the moduli space of Riemann surfaces of genus G with N punctures, some specific example. And I'm very, I'm very uh, um, appreciative of the chain of events which allowed me to participate with my co-authors in this discovery, I view this as really changing our perspective on Teichmuller space and moduli space. I would never have expected that such a thing uh, exists. And I would have advised graduate students to try to prove they don't. <laughs> and by some very securitous proof route, which I'll try to describe, we, we discovered one, and I'll also explain what it means. But in very elementary terms, another discovery, which is sort of fallout from this one, is that Billiards in suitable darts have optimal dynamics. So a dart is a billiard table shaped like this, can be conveniently positioned in front of a bar, so you can play here. <laughs> and uh, I, I will also describe what optimal uh, dynamics uh, uh, means, but it's this close connection between polygons and dynamics on moduli space that will form the core of my talk. So let me begin with a little bit of history. So one of the first things we, we teach calculus students is how to integrate the reciprocal of a polynomial. This can be done by uh, partial fractions. And when we're done with that, you might try to explore integrating the dth root of the reciprocal of a polynomial. And, uh, this too can be done. It has some very interesting and intriguing answers. For example, with the square root of 1 minus x squared in the denominator, you get the inverse sine function. Or with the cube root of 1 minus x cubed, you get this expression involving the Appel hypergeometric function. But if you want to continue in this direction, a couple of things have to happen. First, you have to really learn what dx means. And dx means we're not really integrating a function, we're integrating a one form. In fact, a holomorphic one form. And the modern approach to these integrals is to continue studying them without evaluating them. 
So what we do is we associate to this integral the algebraic curve defined by y to the d equals q of x. Then the function y on this compact Riemann surface x defined by this equation uh, becomes a single valued branch of this uh, d root. And uh, then the form that we're integrating becomes the form dx over y. And in good cir circumstances, that's a holomorphic one form on the Riemann surface. Now the Riemann surface generally acquires some topology so the interesting things are actually the definite integrals of this one form, omega, uh, over closed loops on this Riemann surface. And if you start pursuing this study more seriously, you're led to not just the theory of Riemann surfaces, but to the theory of homology, Hodge theory, automorphic forms, much of modern transcendental algebraic geometry, complex analysis, theory of complex manifolds can be traced to the study of the integral of one forms of this type. So that's gonna be my subject today is uh, pairs consisting of a Riemann surface and a holomorphic one form, which is something you can integrate along a loop. Now first, let's talk about the possible choices for this Riemann surface X. X will be assumed to be compact. It has some number of handles, G, usually two or more. It's known that the space of all such Riemann surfaces itself forms a complex variety of dimension 3G minus three. And this moduli space, it, we'll see, is almost the natural setting for renormalization. Uh, the next uh, thing I want to say about this space is it comes equipped with a natural metric called the Teichmiller metric. And this metric is designed so that the Schwartz lemma holds, that is holomorphic maps from the upper half plane to moduli space are distance decreasing from the hyperbolic metric on the upper half plane to the Teichmiller metric on moduli space. And it's the extremal metric with, uh, with that property, okay? So moduli space is this complex variety. It has a particular metric on it that's defined intrinsically just using the complex structure. Um, now, why am I talking about this at a dynamics conference? This is a very static looking picture. The moduli space doesn't have any natural flow on it or transformation of the moduli space to itself. Well, just wait a moment. So how do we describe a point in moduli space? How can you, if I ask you to concretely give me a Riemann surface, how can you do so? Well, in the case of genus one, it's well known that every elliptic curve can be described by saying you take the quotient of the complex plane by a lattice or more simply you draw a parallelogram and then you identify the parallel sides of this uh, parallelogram you get a closed surface of genus one. How about higher genus? Well there's a uniformization theorem for surfaces of higher genus it may be slightly different from the one you usually think of. Every Riemann surface in MG can be also built from a polygon in the complex plane. So for example, I can obtain a surface of genus three by starting with this 12-sided figure here and then identifying uh, parallel sides by translation. So that's a way to describe every Riemann surface of genus three and any Riemann surface of any genus can be described by using a complicated enough polygon plus some gluing instructions. Okay, now why, why don't we routinely teach this uniformization theorem? It's because this polygonal structure on the Riemann surface is not unique. In fact, it's very hard to tell when two different polygons give the same Riemann surface. And that's because this polygon is giving us more information than just the Riemann surface X. It's giving us the Riemann surface plus the choice of a holomorphic one form on the Riemann surface, this thing we can integrate. And now we have a, th a theorem that's much more natural. Every pair consisting of a compact Riemann surface plus a holomorphic one form on it can be built from a polygon. And so what you do is you take the polygon and you just take the standard form, dz, on the plane, and that form is invariant under translation. So when you glue this edge to this edge by a complex translation, the form goes along for the ride and gives rise to a holomorphic one form on the surface of genus three. 
Well, one of the definitions of the genus is it's the dimension of the space of holomorphic one form. So there's many different ch choices for a given X of this, of this uh, polygonal picture. Um, and we should really think of that as encoding a point in this larger moduli space. Okay, so now let's turn to this moduli space of holomorphic one forms. Now we have dynamics. In fact, the big non-compact Lie group SL2R acts on the moduli space of holomorphic one forms. And this is remarkably something that if you tell this to someone who works on SL2R for all of their life, say on representation theory, they have no idea that this is true. And if you tell it to an algebraic geometer, they have no idea that this is true. <laughs> but in dynamics, we know that it's true, and it's, and it's for an extremely simple reason. Um, so if you give me a, uh, if you give me a polygon describing a one form X omega, and you give me a matrix A in SL2R, I can simply apply that matrix to the polygon. And that gives me the polygon for the image of this one form under this real linear map. Now, real linear maps don't preserve complex structures in general, so usually X, the new X is different and the new omega is different. And here's an example of the kind of families of Riemann surfaces you can get using this linear action on the space of holomorphic one forms. You can get what are called complex geodesics. These are maps of the upper half plane into moduli space that are isometries for the Teichmuller metric. They, every hyperbolic geodesic is sent to a straight line in the hyperbolic metric on moduli space. They're sort of complexifications of the real geodesics that we would have in a Riemannian manifold. And here's an example of such a complex geodesic. They are very simple. They're simpler than most topics in the theory of Riemann surfaces. Here's how I can describe a map from the upper half plane into the moduli space of Riemann surfaces of genus two. So first, I draw a picture of a Riemann surface of genus two in terms of a polygon. So this L-shaped polygon has the property that if you identify parallel sides by translations, it glues up to give a surface of genus two. Now, let's label this top corner by tau one in the upper half plane. I put the base on the real axis. If you give me a second tau two in the upper half plane, there is a unique real linear map that's the identity on the real axis and sends tau one to tau two. And we just shear and expand the polygon according to that real linear map. We get a new shape here. The gluing instructions go over. Translations are sent to translations by linear maps. And so this gives a new Riemann surface of genus two. So this simple picture defines a holomorphic map from the upper half plane into the moduli space of Riemann surfaces of genus two. I find that uh, a remarkable uh, and yet naive and simple uh, uh, construction. And this map, as I, let me emphasize again, this is an isometry for the Teichmuller metric. Okay, now usually when you map a geodesic into a manifold, well, unless it's something like the sphere, it often fills the manifold densely. Certainly in moduli space, even a real geodesic is usually dense. These complex geodesics are even bigger, so they are almost always dense in moduli space. But could it happen that somehow the image of this upper half plane is not dense? Could it happen, for example, that it closes up and forms some sort of finite two-dimensional shape. Well, when that happens, the image is what's called a Teichmuller curve. And this Teichmuller curve is simply an algebraic curve in moduli space that, by some miracle, is isometrically embedded. And then the universal covering map from the upper half plane to this Teichmuller curve is an example of a complex geodesic that wraps itself up very nicely. So to say that more precisely, if you give me a one form, the complex geodesic that it generates factors like this, 
you have a map from the upper half plane into mg. Now this one form might have a big stabilizer in SL2R. That subgroup acts, which I call SLX omega, acts on the upper half plane. And this map factors through the quotient. That's sort of a tautology. And what might happen is that this quotient is very small. It might be a finite volume hyperbolic Riemann surface. And in fact, this stabilizer is big. It's a lattice in SL2R if and only if the map from V into moduli space gives an algebraic, isometrically immersed Teichmuller curve. OK, so these are sort of extraordinarily superclosed complex geodesics. Why do I bring them this up? In fact, are there any examples of these Teichmuller curves? So this is, to my mind, the first surprise in this theory. First, there are. And second, if you want to find these examples, you need to talk to not a complex analyst or an algebraic geometer, but your local billiard theorist. Why are billiard theorists interested in Teichmuller curves? Well, when you study billiards in a polygonal shape, and let's be very precise, maybe make the angles rational multiples of pi, there's a lot of stuff that can happen dynamically. So here's a very simple L-shaped billiard table. And you might hope that every trajectory in this table is uh, either periodic or it's uniformly distributed. Those are two obvious extremes. You can have chaos and you can have periodicity. Now, in traditional dynamical systems, we might be happy with a description of the behavior of almost every billiard path. But it's a modern theme drawing on, on work going back to Hedlin on the Horace cycle flow and embodied in Ratner's theorem on um, unipotent actions on homogeneous space, that in certain sort of zero entropy situations, one can hope very ambitiously to understand the behavior of every single geodesic of every single trajectory for a dynamical system. And uh, well, it's hard to describe that in this table, because there's, there are periodic geodesics. There are some that fill out the table densely. And then there's some that don't do either. So I didn't draw this geodesic forever, but uh, it never closes up. And yet it never goes into these two corners of the polygon. So it's neither uniformly distributed, nor is it dense. It's sort of an ambiguous dynamical uh, uh, behavior. And much worse things can happen. You can have a trajectory that's dense, but spends a lot of time in one part of the Riemann surface and neglects uh, one part of the table and neglects another part of the table. So billiards in polygons is actually a quite delicate uh, problem. Um, uh, on the other hand, there's something amazing which billiard theorists proved in the 1980s. Namely, the billiards in a pentagon has optimal dynamics. That is, every billiard path is either periodic or it is uniformly distributed. And what's drawn here is a fairly long example of a typical aperiodic billiard path. And as you can see, it's filling out the table fairly evenly. And in fact, in the long term, uh, the amount of time this path spends in any region will just be proportional to the area of the region. So this is a, this is a miracle that's very special to this particular polygon. And when this obtains, we say we have optimal dynamics. Charles? You can have both together? Or, or both what? Well, a periodic path cannot be uniformly distributed. <laughs> oh, yes, of course. So you have both. You have both in this example. So you can, if you take the midpoints of the sides, you get a periodic trajectory. But a typical trajectory will be uniformly distributed. Um, OK, now, what does this have to do with Teichmuller curves? Well, there's a way to turn a billiard table into a Riemann surface. In fact, not just a Riemann surface, but a Riemann surface with a one form. And the way this is done is 
the obvious, you need to play the obvious trick. That is, when a trajectory hits the side of the billiard table, rather than reflecting the trajectory, you can reflect the billiard table and put another copy down over here. And then the billiard can just continue along a straight line into this new table. And now it hits the side again, but this side is parallel to this side over here. So then we just glue these two sides together. And the behavior of a billiard in the pentagon then translates into the beha behavior of the straight line flow in this double of the pentagon, but with the sides identified. And when you identify the sides, what you get is a Riemann surface of genus two in this case, with a holomorphic quadratic, with a holomorphic uh, differential on it coming from the differential dz in the plane. And uh, of course, you, there is no way to foliate or comb uh, a Riemann surface of genus two, so this, these straight lines have to have some sort of singular behavior downstairs, and in fact, the corners of this polygon all glue, glue up to make a single point, and that point is a cone point for this flat metric. It has a total angle of six pi rather than two pi around it. Okay, so this is, this is something to keep in mind. One can start with something as naive as a polygon in the plane and turn it into a Riemann surface plus a one form. Now, what about the action of SL2R? Well, what Veach showed is the following. Let's say a polygon in the plane is a lattice polygon if the stabilizer of the corresponding one form in SL2R is a lattice, or more geometrically, if that one form generates a Teichmiller curve in moduli space, one of these remarkable jewel-like objects. And the interest of these is that Veach and Maser proved if you could find a lattice polygon, then the billiards in that polygon would indeed be optimal. And in a moment, I'll say a word about why that's true. Um, namely, it's true because of renormalization. <laughs> okay, now, <clears throat> uh, uh, wh where's the renormalization going on? Well, remember that we have this complex geodesic, but it's obtained by taking our polygon and stretching it and pulling it according to real linear mappings. What those real linear mappings do is they change the Riemann surface in one form, but they take straight lines to straight lines. So they record the dynamics remains the same, just your perspective on the dynamics changes. That's what renormalization is about. For example, I want to study a very long billiard path. Well, I can apply a linear map to make it very short, and then its long-term behavior will be translated into, um, into something that I can see in finite time. <clears throat> and so here's, the, here's just the idea of the proof. You see the, the statement that this generates a Teichmiller curve says that as we apply SL2R, which is our renormalization group, to the polygon we started with, we move around in the moduli space of all polygons or of all Riemann surfaces plus one forms, but we're stuck to this particular finite area Riemann surface. And stretching the renormalization corresponds to moving along a hyperbolic geodesic on this surface. And there's, there's two things that can happen. One is the hyperbolic geodesic can go out a cusp of this Riemann surface and never come back. And when that happens, the geodesic, the, the billiard trajectory is periodic. That corresponds to a periodic slope on the billiard table. The other thing that can happen is that the geodesic winds around, but then it might go into the cusp for a while, but then it comes back again. It's recurrent. It returns infinitely often to a fixed compact part of the surface. That means we have a priori bounds in the sense of Misha Lubitsch's talk. We can renormalize infinitely often. We see a compact set of objects. They're all connected, and with a little extra argument, that proves uniform distribution, uniqueness of the invariant measure, and anything else you want about that particular uh, billiard trajectory. So really, underlying this theorem is this large motif of renormalization that has a very different manifestation <coughs> in complex dynamics. Um, okay, so here's what Beach proved. He proved that if you turn a regular polygon into a one form, take the corresponding 
complex geodesic, in fact, it does generate a tight Miller curve in moduli space. And that's the proof that billiards in a regular polygon has optimal dynamics. <clears throat> okay, now that's, that's some background. Let me come to the main question I wanted to address in this talk. <clears throat> Can we go beyond tight Miller curves? So what I mean by this is the following. See, there's lots of sub-varieties of moduli space, lots of complex sub-manifolds, because moduli space itself is a projective variety. So you can embed it in a projective space, cut it with a hyperplane. You see sub-varieties of all possible dimensions. They move in continuous families, et cetera. <clears throat> but with respect to the Teichmuller metric in, on MG and what's called the Kobayashi metric on the sub-variety, the inclusion of the variety into MG is a contraction. It's not like one of these Teichmuller curves. The inclusion of the Teichmuller curves in isometry, but almost all the subvarieties shrink when you think of them inside of moduli space. So my question was, <clears throat> are there any totally geodesic subvarieties, that is isometrically immersed subvarieties in moduli space of dimension bigger than one? That is, can we go beyond this one-dimensional setting of uh, Teichmuller curves and find higher dimensional varieties? <clears throat> um, okay, and as I said, I would have bet that the answer is no, but it turns out the answer is yes. <laughs> so the, the main result today is that there is a primitive, totally geodesic, complex surface in moduli space. <clears throat> and this surface sits in a very particular moduli space. It's the moduli space of Riemann surfaces of genus one with three marked points. Um, and this, the existence of this surface raises a lot of interesting uh, new questions, and it really changes our view of what moduli space looks like. So for example, you can take the universal cover of this surface, and it seems to be sort of a new type of Teichmuller space. It's analogous to Teichmuller space because this is totally geodesic, the cover is contractible, and yet one can prove it's not isomorphic to any of the known Teichmuller spaces, which are the universal covers of traditional moduli spaces. One can also prove that it's not isomorphic to any known symmetric space. So there's this, this new bounded domain in complex analysis that uh, begs to be studied as intensively as the classical uh, Teichmuller spaces. Okay, so now I'd like to tell you what this flex locus is. And it's a little like the billiard situation. There is a language for explaining what it is, but it's not one too many people speak. It's the language of classical algebraic geometry. So it was current in the 1870s, and one of our sources for this work is this beautiful book of Salmon uh, called Higher plane curves. Now, if you want to know what a higher plane curve is, I'll draw your attention to the fact that this is a sequel to his earlier volume, A Treatise on Conic Sections. So in this, in this volume, he goes on from conic, degree two curves in the plane, to degree three curves for hundreds of pages, and then there's a few chapters on curves of degree even higher than three. So the, the geometry of cubic curves in the plane is already extremely rich. And it's in the language of this classical projective geometry that I'm going to describe the flex locus. So let's think about what I have to do. It sits in the moduli space of curves, of elliptic curves with three marked points. I have to tell you how to pick special triples of points on every elliptic curve, every curve of genus one. And uh, so the first thing, is uh, you have to know is that every curve of genus one can be realized as a cubic curve in the plane. That's the classical theory of the Weierstrass P function and its derivative. Now, if you have a point that's not on the curve in the plane, you can project from that point to a line, and that gives a degree three map from your elliptic curve to the projective line, and that map has six critical points. That is, there's six lines emanating from S that are tangent to the curve A. How do you find them? Well, what you do is you construct what's classically called the polar of S from A, 
It turns out to be a conic. It's a degree one less than the degree of the original curve. So this has degree two, this has degree three, and their points of intersection are the critical points of projection from S. That is, they're the places where the lines through S become tangent to A. Um, okay, so that's, that's a quite general construction, the polar conic, that we can build for any pro point of projection outside of our cubic curve, which we want to study. Now, there's another important object. You may know that a cubic curve in the plane has nine flexes. These correspond to the points of order three in the group law on the elliptic curve. How do you find them? Well, what you do is you compute another cubic called the Hessian of A, and this degree three curve intersects our original de degree three curve in nine flexes, two of which are shown in this uh, picture. And this curve is called the Hessian of A, and it's given uh, computationally by just taking the defining homogeneous polynomial for A and then forming the determinant of its matrix of second derivatives. Um, okay, so this is a, these are two classical constructions in projective geometry. Now, how are they related? Well, remember that the, the polar conic is, a, is just an, some curve of degree two. Often it's an ellipse, but it can degenerate to a pair of lines. When does it degenerate to a pair of lines? Exactly when the point of projection lies on the Hessian. The Hessian is the set of points from which the polar conic becomes reducible, or at which the polar conic becomes reducible. And with that in mind, we can build something that I call the solar configuration. And this is how my coworkers and I actually discuss what's going on in this paper. So we have our elliptic curve A, and we think of this as the Earth. And then we have our point of projection, which we choose on the Hessian, which I've drawn here. And we call that point of projection the sun. Okay, now the rays of light from the sun come out and illuminate the earth. And there are six points where these rays of light become tangent to the earth. Now, if you live on the earth, what's happening at those points? Louder? Yeah, sunset or sunrise. The sun is rising or setting at each of these three points. The sun appears to be on the horizon when you're standing on, uh, on one of these places where the ray of light from the sun becomes tangent to the earth. So we see these six points of sunrise or, or sunset. But which are which? Well, the beautiful thing about the sun being on the Hessian is that three of the tangency points lie on one line and the other three lie on another line. That is, the, con the polar conic has become degenerate. So it makes sense to call three of these the points of dawn and the other three the points of dusk. So the set of six, six rising and setting points naturally decomposes into uh, these two triples. You can't quite tell for sure which is dawn and which is dusk. But let's pick one arbitrarily and call it dawn. Okay, now, I remember I wanted to pick for you on every elliptic curve, a triple of points. And I've almost done that. I could just take the dawn points here. But it turns out what I really want to do is take not the dawn points, but what are called the codon points. These are the places the ray of sun has to pass through before it can get to, to, to illuminate the place where you're seeing dawn. So every line from the sun meets the Earth in three points. One of those is a double point, if it's a point of dawn. The remaining point is what we call a codon point. And now I can tell you what the flex surface is. The flex surface is the set of pairs consisting of an elliptic curve, the Earth, plus the triple of codon points. And the codon point depends on where the sun is. So as the sun moves around the Hessian, you get a whole family of P for a particular A. And that shows that F is a complex surface. In fact, it's an elliptic surface fiber over, uh, over P1. We get a lot of information about what this flex surface is by studying this picture. Um, now, 
those of you who are versed in Teichmuller theory know that if you're going to build a totally geodesic object, it's going to have to have lots of Teichmuller geodesics on it, and these correspond to quadratic differentials. So I need to give some quadratic differentials on my elliptic curve with three marked points. Now these differentials have to have the same number of zeros as poles, and it's natural to put the poles at the codon points. But where should you put the zeros of the differential? Well, there's a natural family of places to put the zero. Namely, we can just take the rays of light from the sun and let them move in different directions. For each direction, we get another triple of points, and there's a unique quadratic differential with poles at codon and with zeros at that intersection with another ray of the sun. So associated to this flex locus is some space of quadratic differentials. Now, I like one forms better than quadratic differentials, so what we can do is we take each of these quadratic differentials and we form its square root. That is, we pass to a Riemann surface where its square root becomes single-valued. That turns out to be a Riemann surface of, uh, of genus 4. It's, an it's a two-fold cover of the elliptic curve branched over six points. And so from this flex locus and these quadratic differentials, we get what we call the Gothic locus in the moduli space of one forms of genus 4. And um, the, really the main theorem underlying all of these developments is that the Gothic locus is SL2R invariant. The, it's, there's an action of SL2R on this space, and this locus with its long-winded description is invariant under the action of SL2R, and it's of dimension 4. And that when you project it down to moduli space, the generic fiber is one-dimensional, so it gives you a threefold called G sitting inside the moduli space of genus 4. Now, how do you end the proof? Well, the, the fact that this locus is SL2R invariant doesn't quite say that, that the Gothic threefold is, is uh, totally geodesic. What it does is it says there's geodesics through every point. It's sort of ruled, but it's a three-dimensional space, so that doesn't make it totally geodesic. But what happens is that when we project back from this three-dimensional ruled surface down to the two-dimensional flex locus, the fiber is one-dimensional, and these geodesics passing transverse to the fiber, when mapped down to F, give geodesics on F going in every direction. And that's why F itself becomes totally geodesic. So there's several miracles which have occurred here. One is that this somehow has to do with an SL2R invariant variety that no one had ever seen before, and the other is that there's this projection which takes this ruling to a space of geodesics going in every direction. Uh, so that's the proof, basically, that F is totally geodesic. I didn't prove the SL2R invariance of the Gothic locus, but it comes from the fact that there's a second elliptic curve in the picture, and uh, one can show that the holomorphic one form we get lies in a particular factor of the Jacobian, which is two-dimensional. And this uh, factor is defined over R. It's linear in period coordinates, and SL2R invariance follows. OK, now, why the Gothic locus? So long before we, um, we found this flex locus, Alex Wright was uh, was uh, sharing with the general mathematical world what we now call the cathedral polygons. So you'll remember, Beach said, you take this pentagon, double it, glue sides together, that should generate a Teichmuller curve. Well, here's what Alex thought. <laughs> By a very circuitous chain of reasoning, he, he realized that if you take a shape that looks like this, and again, glue the sides together by some fairly complicated rule. These are two pictures of the same shape, by the way, and um, the, the uh, colors indicate cylinder decompositions of the surface, horizontal and vertical. If, and if you choose very particular values of A and B, that these polygons should also generate Teichmuller curves, Teichmuller curves in genus 4. He postulated this based on some very int intricate and interesting 
uh, but somewhat heuristic uh, reasoning. And we call this these cathedral polygons because they look roughly like the plan of, of Notre Dame Cathedral or anything else you can see outside. Uh, and, they, and they live inside this locus omega g, uh, hence the name the Gothic locus. So this is now, now a theorem. From this development of the flex locus, we have a new infinite series of Teichmuller curves sitting inside the moduli space of Riemann surfaces of genus 4. Okay, so let me give you a little recap because I started with regular polygons and I, and I got to this new series of Teichmuller curves as sort of a tangible payoff of the flex locus. So let me sum up where we stand, what happened between 1989 and 2016. So here's the space of moduli spaces, genus 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, et cetera. Where are the known Teichmuller curves? Well, there's, there's some sporadic examples that we now understand are associated to the exceptional Coxeter diagrams, E6, E7, and E8. So I put those here. They're sort of, they're sort of special, three special examples. And then there's the infinite series of examples studied by Veach. These come from the regular polygons. Now notice that the genus goes up as you go vertically in this, uh, in this Veach series. So after Veach's work, it was still not known if, for example, there are infinitely many Teichmuller curves in genus two. Then in 2002, Curry and Kalta and I independently proved using some properties of the Jacobian that there is in fact an infinite series of Teichmuller curves just of genus two. And this method could be modified, replacing the Jacobian with the prim variety to show there's infinite series in genus three and genus four. And then finally, this new series, uh, oh, I should say that Bowen and Muller made a beautiful contribution in 2006 in which they showed that the Veach examples and another series called the Ward examples can be incorporated into a single discussion, which also moves vertically. And, uh, that, and then that captured, this was the complete peer, picture as of 10 years ago. And so with the discovery of these new cathedral loci, we now have another horizontal series of Teichmuller curves in genus four. So you notice genus four, things are starting to pile up. And there are heuristic reasons to think in this question mark space, there might be nothing. Or it might all be due to a lack of imagination. Okay, so that's the status report on Teichmuller curves. Now, what might you find unsatisfactory about this whole discussion? I know what puzzled me. What I wanted to know is, does this flex surface fit into a broader pattern? Its discovery was sort of serendipitous. Can we reverse engineer it in such a way that we could find it again in case we accidentally lose it and maybe find more examples? And it turns out there is a way to generate patterns in this theory that's extremely simple. The classical perspective is to study billiards not in pentagons, but in triangles. <laughs> and one can reformulate Veach's uh, results as in the following way. If you take a triangle where the inner angles are proportional to 1, 1, and n, so it's an isosceles triangle, and n is an integer, then billiards in this triangle is optimal. So this is Veach's breakthrough this single tri fa infinite family of triangle. Now soon after, Ward discovered you could change the one to a two. So here's another infinite series of triangles with optimal billiard behavior. And then there were three more discovered that have to do with the E6, E7, and E8 examples. And then uh, Pat Hooper uh, in 2013 discovered uh, a fourth triangle. Yes, I just said. So the, this means three, four, five means the interior angles are proportional to three, four, and five. Yeah. So it's just the it's just the proportions uh, into which you divide 180 degrees. Okay. So that's that's between 1989 and 2013, and there was a lot of work in the middle by Borabets, Kenyon, and Smiley. And I should say we don't know even for triangles if this is a complete list 
of the interesting example. Okay, so now, what is the new frontier? Quadrilaterals. <laughs> so, um, so let me tell you something you can do with a quadrilateral. So here's a kind of funny looking obtuse quadrilateral. I learned recently that obtuse quadrilaterals are called darts. Its inner angles are proportional to one, 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 and nine. This 90 degree angle here corresponds to the nine. And starting with this quadrilateral, you can start unfolding it. So I just reflected it across one of its edges. And then you keep reflecting and you keep going and you'll eventually fill out a sort of crazy star-like shape figure like this. And now again, you can build a Riemann surface plus a one form by gluing together suitable parallel sides. So from this quadrilateral, we get a, again, a one form. And we no longer expect this one form to generate a Teichmuller curve, but we can ask if it does something. Does it have something to do with our flex locus, for example? And by the way, these one forms are extremely simple to write down algebraically. The Riemann surface is given as a six-fold cover of P1 branched over four points, and the form is, as usual, just dx over a suitable power of y. Um, okay, so here is the, what this new perspective gives us. It turns out the Gothic locus is just the closure of the SL2R orbits of the 1119 quadrilateral forms. In other words, if I just said I discovered a new SL2R invariant variety, somebody asked me what is it, I could say just take these quadrilateral forms and now push them around by the action of this linear group and take the closure. Now, my correspondent would probably say, well, isn't that dense? And then I would have to furnish a complicated argument showing that in fact it's, it's only four dimensional. But in terms of defining the locus, it has a very simple definition and it emerges in an almost trivial way from these quadrilaterals. Um, and when you remember the, the equation for those quadrilateral forms had a y to the six in it. So the Riemann surface has a, a Z mod six symmetry. Now it turns out when you hit one of those surfaces with the action of SL2R, the Z mod six symmetry goes away, but you're left with what we call the dihedral forms. That is the monodromy of the map to P1 uh, changes from being the cyclic group inside of S6 to the dihedral group inside of the symmetric group on six elements. And in fact, the variety of dihedral forms that we get is linear in period coordinates, and that gives a proof of SL2R invariance. So this is a new perspective that does not require that book from 1879, basically uses the theory of covering spaces. Um, and uh, as, as, as another bonus, now that we're looking at these quadrilaterals, we can do billiards in them, and it turns out that if you choose the dimensions of this quadrilateral correctly, they give new billiard tables with optimal dynamics. Okay, now, Instead of asking if the Gothic locus or the flex locus fits into a broader pattern, we can ask, does this quadrilateral fit into a broader pattern? And the answer is yes. In fact, there is a suite of six quadrilaterals that have many of the attractive features of the one we serendipitously discovered and can be investigated by the exact same method. And again, they're labeled by simply giving their interior angles, all of them give rise to four-dimensional SL2R invariant uh, subvarieties of the moduli space MG. G varies depending on the shape of the quadrilateral. Um, two of them give families of optimal billiard tables. I just showed you the billiard tables for one of these darts. And I should say that these kinds of darts have appeared earlier in the theory. Bo and Muller uh, constructed some optimal billiard tables in darts, but the angles of their darts were always changing. Um, whereas we can keep the angles fixed and vary the lengths of the sides and get a family of optimal billiard tables, so to speak, in the same genus that way. I should also say that darts seem to be the preferred symbol for various aeronautical organizations, including NASA, its Russia equivalent, and um, some 
more fantasy world. Uh, finally, from these uh, quadrilaterals, we get three different totally geodesic surfaces. So the miraculous flex surface that I started with turns out to have two cousins, one in M14 and one in M21. The M21 is very closely related to the Hilbert modular surface of uh, discriminant five in genus two. Uh, so we've made a fairly complete survey of quadrilaterals within the narrow range of types we can understand, and, uh, and we found this larger suite, in some sense probably complete, of examples that uh, emerge from the same method. And uh, as I mentioned before, there was a 10-year gap in our knowledge of Teichmiller curves, and these objects I'm drawing now, some of them were just discovered in the past few weeks. Now, what about pentagons? Well, our methods can be applied to n-gons of any dimension. It turns out that when you apply them to triangles, you rediscover the Beach and Ward series. When you apply them to quadrilaterals, you get the six examples I showed, and when you apply them to pentagons, you get nothing interesting. Well, that's what we thought, but then we looked at our list more carefully, and we discovered that, in fact, the SL2R orbit of the 112212 pentagon gives a new six-dimensional invariant subvariety of omega M4. So we now have, have seven loci that grow out of these new, this new phenomena related to dihedral covers. And this is what the pentagon looks like. It's not your traditional pentagon. One of the angles here is 180 degrees. And what you'll notice is that if I let these two vertices collide, it degenerates to one of the quadrilaterals that I just showed you. So with these seven examples be finally before us, we sort of imagine we've been touring the ocean and we have finally found seven continents. So we don't quite know how they fit together and our global picture of the world of holomorphic one forms is a little distorted, um, but I think that's par for the course in the age of discovery. Thank you.